And Constable Yu has been with uh, recruit has been with the department since 2006, and has been with recruitment since 2014, and is currently actively engaged in utilizing their social media platforms for recruitment. Uh, don't go away. After this presentation, we will have our closing presentation regarding technology using 3D printing. Thank you. Good afternoon. Well, first off, thanks for having us back. Uh, thanks to Lori for having us back. Thanks to Smile Conference and thanks to Long Beach uh, for hosting this, this great event. Um, you know, right off the bat, my team spent so much time preparing all these scripts and notes and everything, and I usually just fold it and put it behind, much to their, <laughs> much to their chagrin. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the overarching philosophy that we have within recruitment in the OPP. I heard already some questions about recruitment and what we're doing. This is a work in progress for us. It's, a, um, it's an interesting time in policing in regards to diversity, uh, all the discussions that we're having. It's, it's certainly something that's an international concern. How are we best able to reflect the communities that we serve? What we're hoping as a goal throughout this 50-minute this presentation is to try to engage, uh, engage you, talk a little bit about some of the things we're doing in, in Ontario and the OPP to try and recruit the most diverse candidates we possibly can. Um, Gloria will come up after me or halfway through the presentation go into the really meat and potatoes things that we're doing in regards to virtual outreach events and techniques and, and things that have been, you know, are asked of us. Like what do we actually do virtually to try and recruit um, people, individuals and diversity. A little bit about ourselves, the OPP, if you haven't met us. No, we're not from Ontario, which is apparently 37 kilometers from here. Um, <laughs> in fact, it wasn't all that exciting when uh, I told someone at the front, oh, I'm from Ontario, they're like, oh, so, so what? Like, why are you spending the night? It's only 20 minutes down the road, right? So, yeah, it's, it's, it's different. Then she heard me speak, and I said A a couple times, and that was it, solidified. Oh, that Ontario, right? So uh, understanding Ontario and the world, that's, that's where we are. We're uh, a big service of about um, 6,200 police officers. We have 3,100 civilians, so about 9,300 total people. We have an auxiliary unit of about 800 auxiliary police officers. General population of Ontario is about 13.6 million. Um, we police over 1 million square kilometers. Kilometers, I don't know if it's big or smaller than a mile. Big, bigger. So it's not, it sounds better in kilometers, right? So we'll stick with that. <laughs> we do frontline investigative specialized services. We service, we have about 160 detachments in the OPP, um, and we do uh, municipal policing for 324 municipalities as well as all the provincial highways in the province. So it's, a, it's really interesting because people, uh, you get the conversations about Canada. And uh, I was down at a conference in South Carolina, and there was two of us there, and, and one, of the, one of the troopers says, they let both of you go? Like they could spare you? <laughs> I said, yeah, they're getting by. They're just squeezing by without us. But, uh, so it's a pretty big service. But if you look at the totality of the province, I've had the opportunity of working in, in Kenora, which is the closest thing would be uh, I would say North Dakota would be awful close to it. Winnipeg is about an hour and a half away. It's another time zone. I've also worked in Hawkesbury Detachment, which is about 45 minutes from Montreal and 45 minutes from Ottawa. So depending on which team's doing best in regards to hockey, I'd become a fan. Um, it's about a 23-hour drive across, to put it in perspective, how long it would take. So if you put yourself from here and drive 23 hours, where would that get you to? That's about how long it takes. So you understand from a diversity perspective, and reflecting the communities you serve when you police 324 municipalities that span 23 hours across in a population of 13.6 million, where you don't really police the larger hubs of diversity, it becomes a real big challenge for us, right? How do you overcome those boundaries, those barriers, in terms of re re uh, recruiting the most diverse and, and competitive candidates possible? To put things in perspective a little bit further, in Ontario proper, According to, the, according to the Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police, there's a declining interest in policing. And that may be something that you're experiencing in the States as well. Declining rate of application across the board. Um, the, you require a special certificate to be able to apply to a police force in, in Ontario. And last year, the, the testing service that offers that certificate said it was one of their five-year lows in terms of overall testing. Now, we've already talked about that. If you look at the media, what do you see that's good? What do you see that encourages people to want to be police officers? That's something we all have to overcome. And from a recruiter perspective, that's even more challenging. So as you look towards non-traditional applicants, if you look towards the individuals from various cultures and social uh, communities that are different, non-traditional, people that, generally speaking, wouldn't be interested in policing, what on earth is going to convince them to join a police force? Right? That's a huge challenge we have to overcome. 
Um, and it's something that is critical because you can only work really in partnership with your communities. If you don't work in partnership with your communities, if you're not reflective of the communities you serve, there's nothing you're going to do that's going to work, right? So it's with that intent that we embarked on uh, um, uh, social media experience or strategy that we've adopted over the last year and a half or two within the OPP. Our motto, obviously, our, our primary purpose, our, our pillar of, that supports all of our strategic planning in the OPP is to have a healthy workforce of engaged officers that are leaders, right? Because you can't really truly grow, build, and change anything unless you have a healthy, engaged workforce of leaders. Um, and you can't do anything else if you don't work with your community. So they have to be a diverse healthy workforce that are engaged and leaders that will help you grow, build, and change as an organization. People that you're hiring right now, man, think of the change that you've had or seen over the last 30 years in a career, over 10 years or even 15 years in your career. What's going to happen 30 years to come, right? The officers that you're hiring right now are going to help you change in such wonderful and beautiful ways, um, and they're going to see so much change. We have to recruit differently. We understood that. To understand the complexity of our challenge in the OPP, we have an additional um, 830 officers that in the next 18 months are eligible for retirement. So that in, in a force of 6,200 uniform members, not that they're all going to, they might watch me online and I'll put their application, you know, submit their res resignations or retirement notices immediately, but not that they're all going to hire, walk out at any given time, but you certainly do have to prepare for that, don't you, in terms of continuity of operations, succession planning, the leadership, um, the, the exercise in, in competitions that we're going to have to hold internally within the organization, the challenge is going to be acute. So what we have is a commissioner who's very proactive. What we have is a commissioner who decided to reinvest in technology, reinvest in recruitment, and pay acute attention to the role that we play in order to make sure that we have this workforce, this, this ability to at least develop a social media program or component to our recruitment program that we're able to build on Start from somewhere, because it's really fascinating as we look towards why the applications had been declining over so many years. The answer is because 15 years ago, when we didn't jump on the social media bandwagon, all those people who were deciding to become police officers weren't exposed to us. They were on social media. We were doing things in the newspaper, right? And that, that wasn't where the billboard on the side of the road doesn't work, right? I, I used the example last year of me standing in a booth with a shiny button at a university it doesn't work anymore because the non-traditional applicant is still not going to walk up to me and say anything. I walk into information sessions, the things that we do in the auditoriums, right, where we tell people how to be competitive. I walk in and people stop breathing, right? It's, it's your typical people that are always going to apply, criminology, police foundations, they always come in and they, I walk into the room and they know that, I mean, I was, used to joke about how easy my job is, I just left swipe or right swipe, right swipe, depending on if I like your application or not, but it's more complicated <laughs> than that, right? I flip a coin, no, it's, 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 amazing the impact you have in uniform and as we go through all these different things that we're going to talk about I want you to talk I want you to think in the back of your mind because we're purposely going to show you things that you're going to it's unconscious influence how do you unconsciously influence your followers how do you consciously influence your followers how do you make them develop them how do you build that brand loyalty to your organization right we will never go out and say that we're the best police force in the world and no op no police force should what we have to do is all work collaboratively together. The more we can recruit, the better that we can be collaboratively, collaboratively together as police forces throughout North America, the better that we can sell our profession, the better that we can brand policing as a profession, the better, more diverse, more qualified, more competent candidates we're going to be. And really, really, other than that, until every single parent tells their little girl that they can be anything in the world, including a police officer, until that happens, we have a lot of work to do, and I think social media is the way to go. So thanks very much for having us at this conference, and we're hopefully going to get in part at least some information to you, some of the things that we're doing in the OPP. So currently, we, we started in about the end of 2015 with about 1,000 followers on Facebook and about 500 followers on Twitter. Those are just the standard platforms that we're on. Uh, we're at about 85,000 plus followers now across all of our different uh, our different platforms and the only reason why I'm showing you this is I want not, you're going to probably read about all this stuff you're probably doing it all anyways is just keep in mind from a from a diversity perspective the platforms that you're on reflect different diversity different demographics right if you're not on Snapchat and Instagram you're dealing with the older folks that are on Twitter the great old folks that are 2025 20, right or the 30 year olds that are on Facebook Facebook is a tremendous platform and the one that we probably use the most because it's the best in terms of being able to develop good content, 
um, develop the people that are following you to make them more competitive applicants. But if you're not on things like Snapchat and Instagram, you're, you're missing out a whole younger generation that eventually will get to Facebook when they get a lot older, right? And then we want to make sure that we capture them too. And I throw out Weibo on the bottom left. This is an example. It's a Chinese Twitter, right? If you're not on that, just an example of an emergent population that's growing within Canada and something that we want to get kind of ahead of the curve just to develop a footprint on that particular uh, social media platform. So wherever you are, however people communicate, that's what you got to kind of take a look at. And you certainly want to get onto those platforms just to have a presence, just to say you were there. And the longer you've been there, of course, you, you, you get that little bit of extra I, I, your foot in the door with that particular community. So those are just kind of uh, some, some things we're doing. Uh, Facebook Live, Periscope, Gloria will talk about all that later on. Invest in trust. So as, as the manager of uniform recruitment, uh, a lot of questions came up about, you know, does, does command staff let you just post whatever you want? Um, so the commissioner was, was, was kind of steadfast in his resolve to always look at the best, how do we integrate technology in everything we do? And when he looked at recruitment and he said, I want some technology embedded there, technology is really kind of a synonym for innovation, isn't it? And one of the things we had to do was bring our platforms up, our, get, get, enhance our virtual footprints on all, across all social media platforms. And we created a dedicated social media coordinator uh, position. So Allison will be talking at another session tomorrow about the work that she does. But we brought in a civilian through an external competition, brought in someone who's an actual social media expert. Because and one of my biggest pet peeves is everything we do from a recruitment perspective or did was really all about policing. right? All the courses that we take are all about policing. It was so important to me to bring in someone external to the OPP, someone who got, is in that business of social media, who's an actual expert in it. I can teach them a little bit about our culture. It's no different than what we do in policing, right? We, we bring in a police officer, teach you how to be a police officer. Then we also want you to be an engineer so you can be collision reconstructionist. Or we take a police officer and teach them to be a photographer. Or we take a police officer and teach them how to do all these wild and wonderful things that we do. Well, why not take someone with that skill set into the organization and teach them to be a police officer? So we're kind of changing our philosophy for everything we do. And one of the things we did was transform a constable position to a civilian position and bring in a social media expert who's done tremendous work for us. But the, the biggest word there is, is, the is the trust word. I do like to give an overarching philosophy, some guidelines as to what we should do and how we should do, the, do our business. But ultimately, I trust my people to do the right thing. We work on uh, special certain parameters, but my people can post within recruitment um, pretty much anything that falls within what our plan is going to be. You provide an overarching plan, and I deal with any issues that are going to pop up, because issues do pop up, and we like to beat ourselves up sometimes, because our own people are the hardest on us for all the different things we post. If you haven't found that out already, I'm sure you will. You post stuff, and people from within your own organization are the first to take shots at you. Is it Taylor Swift that say, people like to throw rocks at things that shine? So, not that I'll quote her all that often, but but people, <laughs> people do that, right? Um, so just, just keep that in mind. You have to have your, your, your corporate direction. Now, the one thing about us is um, everything we do is focused on, is focused on diversity, right? Um, and I don't, when I say diversity, that's such a special word, isn't it? And people use, it's like community. If you ever ask someone to define community and what do they do, they'll, they'll tell you where they're from. I'm from Montreal or I'm from Ontario or whatnot, but what is community? Aren't you all community right now? Is a Facebook page a community? Your followers, aren't they communities? Is a classroom a community? It's so much more than dots on a map, isn't it? And it's just no different than diversity. When we talk about diversity in OPP, we talk about... to and from that particular area. So diversity is so much more than you know, racialized minority or visible minority. It's about the skills you bring to the table. No different than when I talked about attracting engineers or computer sciences to challenge the issues that we're going to have in policing, to help us grow, build, and change in some pretty special ways to get ahead of the curve for tech crime and whatnot. So diversity for us is so important. These are the, the officers we've got, the female officers we've got in our class of 90 that's on, at the Ontario Police College right now. So it's a, it's a great picture. But everything that we do has to be about that. It's not just about the normal. If we did did everything the way we've always done it, we'd just always be the same, wouldn't we? It's so hard to change, like bending a tree trunk. So just recruitment. The one caveat I'll tell you about um, in regards to this, the trust that I extend to my people, the reinvestment in technology, all the things we're talking about, you probably all have corporate pages, right? I'll use Facebook as an example. You have a corporate Facebook page. Everyone does, the OPP does as well. 
then what happens is usually it's the, the other subsequent pages are divided up among special interest or unit groups within your organization. Just like recruitment, it has a Facebook page. We also have a corporate page. The information we're going to talk to you about now is just recruitment. So the stats, the numbers, the followers, all those things, that's just recruitment. So 85,000 followers across, it's just recruitment social media sites. So I can speak to all those things. When I extend trust, I extend trust to my people. But my, one of my caveats is we do not overstep or overlap onto the operational side. So if someone's got, there's an arrest or an Amber Alert or something else going on, we don't deal with that in recruitment. And for very specific reasons. Because then if everything's mumbled into one or jumbled into one, then one bad thing happens and all those followers right, are exposed to that particular story. So you might have been working for months and months and months and months and months on a recruit, a diversity initiative, and then one thing happens, right? Well, what we're able to do, although it's a silo, we're able to actually separate ourselves a little bit from recruitment, so all the people we're working with and developing and trying to mentor, we keep them a little bit separate, right? So we don't talk about the operational side of the house, and if there is an operational issue, then you just refer to that particular Facebook page. So value-driven. So my direction is very simple. It's guiding principles. We have our values within the OPP, professionalism, accountability, diversity, respect, excellence, and leadership, and that's great. But within recruitment, I, my fundamental practice is I told my social media carrier, all my people that post to social media, I need it to be value-driven, I need it to be focused on people, and I need it to be the betterment of all. If you just focus on those guiding principles, value-driven, focusing on people for the betterment of all, if it fits within that criteria, post away, right? And if you post something that's wrong, well, so be it. I'll, I'll wear that one and we'll, I'll lay on my sword for it. But obviously you did the right thing for the right reason and we're good to go. So if we just do that, we're good. So something as simple as this video that I'll play is it just a 30 second video. Make a difference. So you studied. And you studied harder. I show that particular video is um, is is the result it, it being value driven and that's what I'm trying to the point we're not we're the OPP we're not going to be sensational at the best of times we don't have a sense of humor um, so everything we do has to be value driven that particular video is the kind of the departure of you're not going to see in, in recruitment much of people repelling off of towers we have that we have our packages and rescue team we will show dogs because everyone loves dogs but the odds of you becoming a canine handler are slim they are, let's be honest. The odds of you being on our tactic and rescue team are, are slim, right? So we kind of moved away from that, to not to discourage people who see that as the only option in policing, right? The reality is that over 75% of our officers are gonna be constables for their entire careers. So that's what we have to sell, that that role, that particular job in the front line is so vitally important for us in our communities, that that's, that's exactly what we're recruiting for. So with everything being value driven, um, I trust my people and I know that they'll post the right things. So that particular video that you just saw, we, all we did was post it to Facebook. It had 138,000 hits in about three days and the reach was about 330,000. And it's not sensational in any way, nor do I would expect it to be. But it falls within our values and exactly what we'd expect. This particular post, we were trying to come up with something different that would grab someone's attention and that's just me reaching out my hand, the prettiest part of my, my, my body here. And the post alone hit a, hundred, a million people were reached, 128,000 clicks, 15,000 likes. Um, it's, it seems like something so simple. Um, but what's great about having social media coordinators, something like, oh, well, there's a red Canadian flag, so we need a red pen to contrast the color. And see, if this was Ontario, California, you wouldn't see that white stuff in the back for all y'all. It's snow, <laughs> right? That's, that's, that's what that is. It's, it's just as soft at times as, as sand, and we, but we have a lot of it. And, we're really, really excited when it goes away about this time of year. 
So from professional development content, one of the most important things we have, one of the biggest challenges we have is what content do you put? What do you put on your web page that can consciously or unconsciously influence the people you have? It's a recruitment-based web page. How do we keep 40,000 followers on Facebook or 85,000 people across all of our, our platforms? How do we do that from a recruitment perspective? So we moved away from recruiting the individual and we started move, rec moving towards recruiting the community. And what does that mean? So what kind of an inbound marketing approach do you have? What kind of content are you adding? What content do you have that really teaches your people what it takes to be a competitive applicant to a police organization? So if you look at this particular uh, content, that's just three postings we have. One's based on family, one's based on confidence, and one's based on our value of our commitment to a healthy and engaged uh, fitness lifestyle, right? How healthy you are as, a, as an individual. So as we move towards away from policing and started posting more things from TED Talks about how to communicate more effectively to help you through an interview, right? We'll post things from uh, Harvard Business Review about how to dress professionally for an interview. Because people show up and if you've done recruitment, they don't know how to dress. They don't know how to shake a hand. There's that poor kid who just rolled out of bed, decided to be a cop one day, and still has the tag on his suit when he comes into his interview, right? So if we want people to be more competitive, we want them to know what our values are, why don't we just post stuff about that? So that anyone who's following us, who's interested in professional or personal development, will learn something from following us. And then what we're gonna do is we get the dad and the mom who want their kid out of their house, so they start following us, and they learn about what we're all about, and they say, that's pretty cool. And then what they do is they, kick, they, they make their kid watch us, and they kick them out of the house and hope they apply to the OPP, right? But on, on the flip side of that, think about the other communities. What kind of community advocates do you have? What we're trying to do is connect with people from communities we haven't been able to reach. We understand and we have to know that social media transcends all barriers, doesn't it? It transcends cultural, social, and geographic barriers of all kinds. And that's the point. There's people we can't reach. There's generations of people we have missed and haven't been able to touch. Then the idea of social media is that we can reach out and touch them. The idea is that we can connect with somebody who's part of a community that we haven't reached and try and get them to advocate for us. So when that professional sees, you know what, they, they're interested in this. They're interested in family. They're interested in fitness. The OPP has stuff about TED Talks and Harvard Business Review and the Huffington Post and Inc. and all those different things. When they see that and every morning they log in because you have to have that all strategy strategized up, right? When you're going to post it, how you're going to post it, all that kind of stuff. I won't get into that. But I want them to get up every morning, every 40,000, all 40,000 followers, and watch what we're doing. And then talk about it at work, and talk about it with their community. And hopefully, by being different, we attract a different applicant. Humanizing job. I think I've quoted five times you've heard this. I'm just going to throw it there really quick. The posts that we do, it's about influence. How do we influence people? What do you see there? You see a person on a, on, you know, obviously hockey, with hockey and everything, but on Team Canada, right, who's now a staff sergeant within our, our organization who does a lot of outreach and helps us out. You see an emergency response team member on the right-hand side who, everyone, anyone heard of the Marathon des Sables? Right, that marathon in, in Africa where people die, right? She went and did that. Not wired right, if you ask me, but still. <laughs> still, we need people like that in this organization, right? And so if you look at what we're trying to do is we're trying to show that we have successful female officers that have been done some pretty tremendous and great things. What they've done, I can't even hope to achieve. I mean, I get, she would destroy me in hockey and I, would, I, I couldn't even carry that backpack. <laughs> right? But we're trying to humanize the job just to show you what, you what you can do and what our people are all about. Strategic campaigns, uh, Facebook, you know, one of, the, one of the key things as we start moving towards the actual conversation we're going to have about attracting the female applicant, one of my goals was a 50-50 male-female following. How do we do that and how do we achieve that? So I want you to think about, when we first started off, it was about 30% female followers. And we've been able to maintain about a 50-50 ratio across all platforms of male-female followers. And I think a lot of it is about the strategic content that we have. Add, and some of the initiatives that we're using that Gloria is going to talk about. So how do you have that? And how does that translate over to applicants? It takes time. You have to work. You have to influence. You have to educate. You have to build confidence in the diverse applicants and non-traditional applicants because they're not used to it. It's really hard to go out and try and convince someone who's 23 and walked out with an IT degree that for the first time ever you should try policing and then expect them to be qu competent, qualified, and able to pass all of our, our standards and testing, right? That takes some time and some work, but if you follow us over time, you'll learn what and how to be competitive. So we're about a 50-50 male-female following uh, on Facebook alone, and that's, that's pretty good. We're, we're getting there right to where we want to be. Um, the REACH program, it's Recruit Essential Applicant for Competitive Hiring. Basically, the gist of it is, 
we learned that no matter what we did, we weren't attracting enough female applicants. No matter what we did. I look in the room 50-50, look in population 50-50. The easiest diversity issue that we have in policing, I think, is a 50-50 male-female demographic in policing. If we can somehow break that, wouldn't that be the most incredible thing ever? And no matter what we were doing, we were having some issues. We weren't able to, the 50-50 male-female followers wasn't translating over to the applicants. It was going up by about 6, 7% in terms of the females being hired to about that 25 percentile rank of all of the people that were hiring, but we still weren't, weren't there. And the, and the question arose, is how, what can we do differently? What about an alternate stream? What if we did something that was just a little bit different, that was a softer approach, a more personalized approach, what about an alternate stream to becoming a police officer? We created the REACH program. The REACH program came out about three months ago, um, and basically what it is is a, um, it's a preparatory program for non-traditional applicants. So if you apply to this, we basically say, if you haven't envisioned being a police officer forever, if this is something new to you, if this is something different, apply to this program. We're gonna help you, we're gonna mentor you, we're gonna do small group sessions, you're gonna meet with an HR person, not a police officer, they're gonna talk about competency interviews, they're gonna talk about fitness and fitness plans and fitness development. They're gonna talk about all those different things to help prepare you for a career in policing. So when you do apply, you're ready. It's that little bit of confidence. Right? So in the first three months, we've had 250 applicants. 72% of the applicants have never applied to policing before. 36% were female. 25%, 21% visible minority, and 51% spoke another language outside of English. Just an example of something you can do. Of course, they have their own uh, Facebook group. Uh, we have a dedicated social media plan for that. But just an example of something that we can kind of, it's a, it's a branch off of our social media strategy that's geared towards a non-traditional applicant, and the results have been Outstanding. If you do something different, you'll get a different result. Thank you, Inspector McKillop. Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Gloria Yu. I'm a constable with the OPP, and I am uh, one of the uniform recruiters. So my two main roles is to uh, attract the most suitable and competitive applicants, and then interview, and then hire them. Um, so just to uh, continue on with our strategy, uh, when we talk about uh, campaigning and we talk about marketing strategies, the OPP uh, and, and all the other law enforcement agencies, of course, right, we talk about hashtags, we talk about uh, global events that are trending around the world that we're all aware of. Um, International Women's Day, uh, if you've never heard of it before, it has been trending since the early 90s, uh, way before social media, of course, right? Um, when it comes to females, uh, March the 8th, uh, has been International Women's Day, and there's always been a different theme. And this year's theme was hashtag be bold for change. Be bold for change. And the word change really rung a bell with me because our, our campaign focus right now, as you saw from the logo, was grow, build, and change, right? And to grow and to, to change requires uh, a commitment, and that's something that we look for in our applicants when they're, when they're applying. Um, a commitment to fitness, a commitment to continuous learning, work ethic, uh, their community, serving their communities, being leaders in their communities. So what a better way to, uh, to attract and hire women uh, than to campaign around International Women's Day. So we did a campaign, and it was from March 1st to the 8th, uh, 8th being International Women's Day. And uh, when you think about um, you know, memory, when you think about how to be effective, anybody ever heard about the uh, rule of three? the power of three, right? Um, we, uh, we talked about last year when we were here about the trifecta in the OPP trifecta being uh, doing three coordinated events that are targeted and uh, one after another so that we build momentum, right? And uh, engage the most followers, engage the most people to be uh, applying to us. Um, we also introduced the hashtag OPP women because as the inspector said, we, we are recruitment, right? And uh, to, um, to separate us in a way, um, uh, from our corporate campaigns, when it's always just hashtag OPP, hashtag OPP, we always use hashtag OPP women, um, hashtag, and uh, it always coordinates with the campaign that we're using. And when it came to this uh, strategy, over a 28-day period, just in the last month, we went from 47 female followers and 52% women to 56% engagement in, in the last month that are females, out of them all, than what you saw there. And the hashtag OPP campaign went really, really well. Um, of course, when it comes to uh, opportunities in policing in a male-dominated profession, we had to uh, let our followers know what we meant by endless opportunities. 
in, uh, in our organization, right? When it comes to opportunities for advancement, specialization, um, we are a deployed service. We have over 160 detachments across the province of Ontario, and they have the opportunity, if they choose to, to work in every single one of them, right? To, so to illustrate that through social media, via pictures, videos, and live streaming, we highlighted the, uh, the journeys of uh, six OPP officers of every single rank. So for the OPP, we start with constable, to sergeant, staff sergeant, inspector, superintendent, and chief superintendent. And uh, we started off with, uh, with, a, with a constable and showed the journeys of all the hard work that they'd done, right? All the uh, detachments and deployed places that they've worked in across uh, Ontario, and some traveling overseas doing UN missions and whatnot. We also flooded them with the consistent content that we use, right? Uh, professional networks, um, all from uh, very reputable journals. Um, we have uh, focus on fitness. We had focus on uh, leadership, community service. And of course, we hosted a bunch of giveaways, right? So you can see there, hashtag OPP women. If you use the hashtag, you can um, be eligible to win cool prizes like from our off-duty shop, different clothes, uh, swag bags, uh, shaker cups, opportunities um, to uh, meet uh, officers that's going to be coming on in our next challenge. And our reach just for the hashtag OPP women is just under half a million since we've been using it. And we've only been using it for the last month. When, the OP when it comes to the OPP, if you think about us as a deployed service, we have 324 municipalities, right? The lands, waterways, and trails that um, we police the areas where there is no municipal, city, or regional police service. So we're trying to attract people who uh, live in these communities and also highlight through social media, look at, you can, you can work in West uh, Ontario. You can work in Southwestern Ontario. However, if you meet somebody in the future, right, even though you don't have a partner right now, or one day you want to have kids, you want to retire, you want to move up north, you can travel laterally throughout the province, keep your job, keep your pension, keep everything, and have the support of um, our resources for work-life balance, for, um, for mental health, um, and the support for advancements when it comes to uh, courses. So, the trifecta. If you uh, had a chance to uh, listen to us last year, we talked about the, uh, the three things that we mainly do to attract candidates on um, social media. The first being our virtual ride-alongs, right? So for the OPP, in especially West Region, which is Southwestern Ontario where I work, we don't actually, for liability reasons, right, host ride-alongs where you have a civilian just step into a cruiser with a, with a police officer and start responding to calls for service. You can see that there would be some issues with liability. Well, to... Uh, to um, bridge the gap, I guess would say, for females and any applicants who are interested in policing, we said, okay, they can't go on the cruiser with us. Why don't they live vicariously through us? I'll go on the cruiser. I'll go back on the front line, go back to my detachments where I worked in and in, in detachments where, um, throughout my region, and I'll host virtual ride-alongs. Just like our uh, sergeant uh, in Northeast region, uh, Jen Nole, she just did two virtual ride-alongs in uh, Northwest region, right? So if you're thinking anything north of Thunder Bay, Ontario, okay? She did it in Marathon, she did it in Cornora, and normally what we do is we host it for about six hours, because anything longer than that, the attention span's kind of waning a little bit, right? And we always use the same hashtag, OPPVR, which stands for OP, uh, OPP Virtual Ride Along. We did it on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram uh, over a period of six hours, and our reach was just over 377,000. Basically, it's a uniform recruiter partnered with a frontline officer, and uh, of course, right, public and officer safety, you're probably thinking, wow, um, how do you guys live stream videos when you're doing virtual ride-alongs, right? Like, this isn't cops. We're, <laughs> we're not allowed to just live stream videos like TV shows um, because of pu public and officer safety, right? So we always set guidelines on our website in advance. Every follower knows that in order to participate during the ride-along, if we say standby for status, they're to stop tweeting. They need to know to wait to hear back from us for a status check. They only ask questions that are relevant to the virtual ride along. We don't notify them of any names, locations, any, anything to identify the people that we stop in vehicles or call for calls for service. And uh, they must tag us at OPP underscore hire and include the hashtag OPPVR. And we usually complement this with a, a giveaway or a contest of some sort so they stay engaged all the way through and then we announce the winner at the end. The next thing is the uh, of our trifecta is uh, the OPPBB, which stands for Breaking Barriers. And it's a live stream mentoring session, and we always have different themes, right? In the past, we've done diversity, officers with multiple languages, fitness, athletes, junior officers, competitiveness, and this year, we did women. 
And in our countdown to International Women's Day, the virtual ride along was on March 1st, and in this case, the, uh, the OPPB was on March the 8th on International Women's Day. So in my office, I uh, just set up a little intimate setting, right? Just as if you were to you know, go to a detachment and meet an officer and say, hey, do you have like 15 minutes of your time? Sit down, have a coffee with me. I really want to learn about you know, your organization. What's it like responding to calls? You know, what's it like stopping vehicles at 3 o'clock in the morning? Most people look at me and go, you stop vehicles at 3 o'clock in the morning, right? <laughs> yes, I do. I have. I loved it. And uh, you know, we all do, right? OPP officers usually patrol alone, and we partner up at night. So to dispel those myths, break the barriers, any concerns that they may have, their family's not supportive of their police choice. If they want to have children, what kind of supports will they have? What kind of opportunities are available to them right, in policing? So tim intimidating, what can they do uh, to, uh, to beat those personal challenges, meet them? Uh, how do they balance shift work? How do they factor in fitness when, in the training and everything like that? Uh, our reach just for the, uh, the OPBBB was basically one hour. Right, I interviewed two uh, female officers. One had a month on the job, and the other one had uh, over 15 years on the job. So you can see the, the difference there, the spectrum. And uh, our reach was over 49,000 followers in one hour, and we had over uh, just close to 10,000 views on uh, Periscope and Facebook Live. And then the last for the trifecta is to just culminate all that, uh, all the momentum, right? And uh, the other two events were mainly virtual. You can either watch them on Facebook Live, Periscope, watch the engagement on Twitter, participate during the live chats, but we never lose that one-on-one -on -one contact, which is so important, right? Especially in this day and age when, when uh, you know, the, some of the people that are applying, they, they don't not, you have to teach them how to hold a conversation, right? Like when they come to the interview, it's not like, hey, yo, what's up, right? That's not how they talk to us in person. So we always try to engage them, bring all that back, bring back that professionalism and tell them what can you do to make yourself the most suitable and competitive applicants because that's all we hire. So for, for OPP Women's Symposium, we posted it in January 1st. The cutoff to apply was February the 15th. And just in West Region alone, so Southwestern Ontario, we had over 160 applicants. So even from as far as uh, Sudbury, Ontario, which is probably about a eight to nine hour drive away from where we were hosting the, uh, the uh, event. We invited over 104 and 100 of them came. And the agenda for the day is basically a recruitment presentation, explain to them the process, what, how to make themselves competitive, but to, um, to basically target some of the areas of concern that some females may have uh, difficulties in. Self-confidence, fitness, work-life balance, shift work, family, any concerns that they may have, we tried to dispel them in any way possible, whether it was informal mentoring during our breaks and at lunch. We also had a mentoring panel consisting of eight officers. Um, we also had males there as well, because I didn't want uh, the males to feel excluded. I wanted the, the women to know what it was like to sp hear the perspectives of male officers too. And uh, after that whole day, um, you know, we talk about humanizing the job, of course, but how to stay motivated as a law enforcement officer after a year on the job, not hard. How do you stay motivated after 30 years on the job? That's a bit of a challenge too, right? So we had officers from different ranks, uh, different experiences. Uh, they explained how to overcome personal challenges. They explained, you know, workout strategies. We talked about how to overcome, um, you know, the fitness test to qualify. And uh, then we followed it up with our REACH program and then also leadership, which I'm going to get to later. You're probably all wondering what that's all about. So at the end of it all, one day, 100 women from all over Ontario with one dream. Policing, law enforcement, security, protection, whatever it may be, right? We all are part of the law enforcement community. We're all part of the same family. We all want to hire competitive, suitable applicants. So even if these, some of these women may not necessarily in the future apply to the OPP, they know what our standards are. They know how to make themselves a competitive applicant. And hopefully they can, they can t um, pass that information on to people they know as well. Oh, after one day, we had just close to 200,000 followers for our reach in one weekend. And when we added up and did the math for all of the women's events that we did over an 11-day period from March the 1st to 11th, we had over 1.3 million for a reach, which we thought was pretty incredible. So what is reach? Reach stands for Recruit Essential Attributes for Competitive Hiring. So for the OPP, even though we have close to 10,000 members, we, we do not have close to that, right? We're all recruiters, of course. We have 10,000 recruiters in the OPP. 
um, because we have 10,000 members, but we don't have close to that when it comes to our recruitment team. And when it comes to hiring, right, you can only be in so many places at once. You can host a presentation like this and have maybe 150 people in the room, or you can do a live stream presentation and have over 1,000 viewers in a few hours. In this case, we have a one-on-one -on -one mentor who is an outreach uh, coordinator. Uh, she's actually a civilian, her name's Angie Sloan, and she is the one who really, really does the legwork, right? So after all of these virtual ride-alongs, mentoring sessions, all these w uh, women's symposiums, all of these applicants, are all, they're all, they're all gung-ho, they're all jacked up, they're like, I wanna apply, I wanna apply tomorrow, right? But it's a process, and you don't become competitive overnight, and it all comes down to a commitment. And so what do we do? We mentor them after all of these events. And that's where Angie comes in. She does the relentless follow-up piece. She's the one, she picks up the phone and calls up every single one of those 160, 67 applicants who applied for the Women's Symposium. And she calls them and says, hey, my name's Angie Sloan. I'm the outreach coordinator for the OPP recruitment unit. How can I help you? Where are you along in the, in the application process? How can we help you become more competitive? What are you doing? Do you need some fitness mentoring? Do you need you know, the five, uh, couch to 5K program? Do you need the couch to 10K program? Whatever you need, she's there. And it really, really complements our trifecta model, right? Because we can't be in, in multiple places. And there's, uh, there's six regions across the province, and uh, we can't be in all of them at the same time. So Angie, she, what she does is you have to apply for the program. She vets all the applications. Right? And then what she does is she picks the most competitive people and she contacts them personally. She will drive from our general headquarters to their local neighborhoods and what she'll do is she'll do small group mentoring. About five to seven people, it could be in a Starbucks, Tim Hortons or around here, I don't know, Dunkin' Donuts. Um, I'm trying to think of some uh, coffee places, right? Um, Krispy Kreme, whatever it may be. And what she'll do is she will uh, sit down with them and do a two to three hour mentoring session. So she will review their resume, their application, their cover letter. She'll review uh, their fitness uh, routines, their workout logs. And what she'll do is she'll also help them when it comes to the interview process, how to answer questions properly, how to respond to competency questions. And that, that is a really, really vital piece because for us, even as recruiters, when they show up for an interview, I expect them to be ready, right? But you don't get ready like that. And it is a process, and that's where, where Angie comes in, and she does that mentoring. And so far, we've launched the REACH program for three months now, and our REACH so far is on uh, virtually is over 225,000. And as you saw, heard from the numbers from the inspector, it's, uh, it's, it's very, very effective and seems to be working, and it really complements our, our uh, recruitment presentations that we do as well. So, the title of our presentation, right? Leadership her ship, you get it, okay. Um, it is a Facebook group, okay. So when you think about blogs and you think about, uh, you know, all these websites where people can go on there and, and they can make comments and they can follow and they can follow the trends and what the inspector had said, right, we want people to engage with us on a daily basis. Policing is a, is a calling or law enforcement is a calling. It's not something that you just, you know, decide to do and then next week you put in your application and then you show up for an interview and get hired, right? It is very, very competitive process. We receive thousands of applications a year and we can only hire the most competitive to fill the classes. So, when it comes to leadership, so after we did all these virtual events, the women's symposium, we followed up everybody with Angie, right, for the REACH program, now we invite them to join leadership, which is our Facebook professional network group. And it's open to um, anybody, right, who's uh, a civilian and a law enforcement officer. And it's an opportunity for women who are interested in a law enforcement or policing career to engage with those who are in the profession. So you're mentoring each other, you're networking each other, you're meeting people from your own neighborhoods, from around your region. You know, it's, it's actually become really, really effective because now we're seeing followers, they're going, hey, I'm from there. Do you want to go meet at the local gym? We'll go for a run together. They're forming running groups together. They are, they're engaging with each other and they're engaging with officers who can provide them real tips, right? They can, the, how to become competitive and what it's really, really like to be on the job. When it comes to uh, our uh, leadership Facebook group and even all these platforms that you've seen today that we have, um, our uh, social guru is Allison Lawrence. And I don't want to single her out because I know she'd hate me for that. Um, but you're going to meet her tomorrow uh, during the breakout session, hashtag OPP recruit. And Allison really is the one. She's the one engaging all 85,000 plus followers on social media on a daily basis uh, on all of her platforms. 
And uh, when it comes to this network, we launched it less than a month ago. And so far, our reach is over 11.5 thousand. Sorry, 11,500, and it's growing, right? And we invite you guys to join it as well. If you go on our Facebook group, at OPP Careers. Um, we want to make it as, as large as possible. It just literally launched like three weeks ago, and uh, it has been very, very encouraging so far. So how did we get here? Seems like a very, very uh, short time ago when I entered the unit, and uh, Inspector Quigley said, you're gonna be in charge of Facebook and Twitter. And uh, as a law enforcement officer in the past, you know, this is my 11th year on the job with the OPP, I can tell you that before when I was on the road, I was like, no social media for me. I don't want anybody to know where I live. I don't want the bad guys to know where I hang out, right? I want to live a personal life. And um, that was unfortunate because I was living under a rock. And uh, when I joined the unit, um, it really, really opened my eyes to see like how effective this really can be. Uh, you, you know, we're talking about no barriers unprecedented global access to anybody who's interested in our organization or in policing or a law enforcement career. Uh, we launched on social media in 2012, less than five years ago. And as you can see, when we first started out, after two years, we were doing okay. We were doing all right, right? Twitter, about 1,600 followers. Facebook, 569 followers. And basically, as a uniform recruiter, after I'm done interviews, after I'm done traveling to recruitment presentations, I tried to, if I had, about 30 minutes a day or an hour a day to go on social media and post things. Well, after uh, Inspector McKillop joined our team in the fall of 2015, we had a joke actually before, just on a tangent, I go off on tangents a lot, we're sitting there and I was thinking to myself, Allison's the guru, the inspector's the genius, and I'm Gloria. I'm just Gloria. Happy with that, it's GGG. Anyways, um, so when it came to uh, Inspector McKillop joining our team, fall 2015, we added the civilian position social media coordinator, okay? And that, they, it was, that was their full-time job. That's all they did was monitor and engage our followers, not 24 hours a day, right? Eight hours, paid day, um, and uh, post stuff, professional networking, content, right? Work-life balance, self-confidence, leadership, the importance of volunteering, all of these articles, and also, of course, uh, posting our events and what we're doing across the province. We also focused in 2015 on our inbound marketing strategy and the goal of diversity, right? Which really, really helped because you could see the, uh, the effects. 3,000 followers on Twitter and 5,000 followers, right? Tenfold in, uh, in a matter of uh, less than a year uh, on Facebook, our uh, followers increased. In the spring of 2016, that's when we started doing strategic campaigns, right? So paid campaigns, boosted profiles, um, we did um, uh, the promoted tweets on Twitter, and we also launched the, uh, the trifecta, which is the virtual ride-alongs, the breaking barriers, mentoring sessions, the symposiums, any large-scale events, right? And we always made it strategic that, so that we're building momentum and, uh, and then letting there be a rest period and then building it back up again. And, of course, 9,000 on Twitter, 14,000 on, on Facebook, which we were very, very proud to announce last year when we were here as guest speakers. Um, and then now, 2017. In a short period of time, in three months, uh, we added an outreach coordinator who's in charge of the REACH program. We also, just in March alone, the new hashtag OPP Women, the International Women's Day countdown with the bios and the giveaways, and then last month, leadership, the Facebook group. And when you look at the whole thing, I mean, it's, it's tremendous. Um, I, we're so proud to be part of this team, right? We have uniform recruiters across the province who are watching right now at home. We couldn't do any of this without you. I mean, there's three of us here today and we're very blessed to be here and honored, but we couldn't have done any of the work that we've been doing uh, over the last uh, few years if it wasn't for all your hard work. So, in conclusion, before we proceed to questions that you may have, I just want to thank uh, SmileCon for inviting us back and Lori, Lori Stevens, I'm not sure where you are, but thank you so much for, uh, for your generosity and your hospitality. And uh, I also want to um, just uh, thank you, the audience, uh, virtually and here today. The OPP, we, we are hiring like crazy. Um, we will hire hundreds of new OPP officers in the next few years. But like I said before, right, we're, we're all recruiters. Whether you work in your recruitment branch or your recruitment unit, we are all recruiters because ultimately we want competitive, suitable, honest, hardworking, right, professional people who are going to fill our shoes one day. And uh, I think hopefully you've learned something um, from some of the strategies that uh, we put into place and we look forward to learning from you as well. Any questions? 
Go ahead, sir. Yes. Yes, because when it comes to policing, not just the OPP, competitive is such a vague term, right? And uh, we, we encourage anybody who's interested in an in a OPP career to one, come out to our, one of our constable information sessions and meet a uniform recruiter, right? So potentially meeting the person who's going to be doing their interview one day um, when they apply. The other thing that we do, the second thing we tell people is to engage with us on social media, right? So follow us, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, LinkedIn, uh, Weibo, whatever it may be, so that they can connect with Allison, our social media coordinator, and also uniform recruiters like myself, Sergeant Olay, um, you know, Acting Sh uh, Sergeant Sternette Williams, anybody who is on um, so any of our platforms doing virtual ride-alongs, live stream mentoring sessions. And of course, connect with us, right? connect with us through email, phone call, whatever it may be. When they come to our presentations, we, we tell them, this is what the application process is like. This is what we're gonna ask you at the interview. And there's something when, when they come to our, our constable information sessions, we call it the pie chart of competitiveness, right? So when it comes to being a competitive ap applicant, every police agency, every law enforcement agency, you may be looking for something different, but we tell them what we're looking for. High level of competitiveness when it comes to fitness, being fit for duty, fit for life, right? So we'll tell them, you're gonna be running 10 kilometers when you go to the OPP Academy. You're gonna be running that every other day. So when you come to the interview, we expect that. We expect that in your fitness logs. We make them fill out fitness logs during the application process. And it's mandatory that they complete these logs and submit them bi-weekly, right? So we can gauge their fitness and make sure that they're gonna pass the Ontario Fitness Pin Test and that they're gonna pass at the OPP Academy. So we say competitive, it's up to them to find out what that means. And if they follow us, on social media, if they come visit us in person and they listen to our presentations and ask questions, they will know what we're looking for when it comes to the interview. And if they don't do any of the things that we said, then they won't know and they won't be successful. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Sir? Yes, so the Uniform Recruitment Unit, we hire OPP police officers, so we, we don't do any civilian hiring. However, a lot of our projects are partnered with our auxiliary unit, which are volunteers. We also promote, um, our, we have five provincial communication centers with dispatchers and call takers, and they're all hiring as well, right? So we always direct people to the website, and then also we always bring in, whenever we do mentoring panels um, or live stream mentoring, we'll have people who are former auxiliaries who are volunteers, right? What did they do to make themselves competitive to become a civilian to uniform? We'll also have people who have worked in the, the dispatchers and call takers, right? explain their jobs, explain their hiring process, but it's not our, it's not our, um, our unit or our, our expertise, so we always defer to the units. Did you want to add to that, Beth? Yeah, just, um, don't let my gun. Oh, so just really, in, in speaking to that, when I talk about alternate streams of entry into uniform recruitment, so we are uniform recruitment, not civilian, we don't deal with that, but usually the hiring manager is responsible for dealing with that wherever branch they're from. But what we've learned very quickly is that the comm centers, the, our special constables, the people that work with civilian data entry, the civilians within our organization uh, form a large part of our hiring pools. It's an opportunity to build that loyalty to, to the organization, our brand, to be able to look at them a little bit longer and to be able to facilitate a person's movement from civilian to uniform. So we do look at that from an alternate stream perspective. Given the amount of followers we have now, we do work closely with a lot of other parts of the organization to do things like broadcast, help them. They'll come to some of our sessions and set up booths and information sessions with us. So we do help them to the extent we can, but the important thing here, we are uniform recruitment. Um, we recognize that as an alternate stream of entry into the uniform component. My auxiliary uh, partners in the OPP probably aren't too fond of me right now because they, as, every time they get a good candidate, I try and steal them from them, right? So, yeah. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you very much. Can we have a round of applause for Constable McCallop and, excuse me, Inspector McCallop and Constable Yu. Thank you very much.